Okay, welcome everybody. This is Dr. Kevin Connors. We're going to talk a little bit about cancer pain. A lot of people with cancer have pain, and you could uh, you could classify it in a couple of different classifications. Sometimes it can be good to have pain with cancer. Uh, not that we want to have pain, but it can be a good sign, and sometimes it can be a bad sign. So that's what we're going to call cancer: good pain, bad pain. So different possible causes of pain with a person with a cancer diagnosis. Well, number one, it could be associated with tumor growth. And that that's, tends to be, if you have cancer and you have pain, you tend to think, oh my gosh, I'm getting worse. And that can be true. So if the cancer is growing, uh, it can increase in pain. Now, a lot of cancers don't have any pain associated with it. And I've had many, many patients with stage four cancers with diagnosed very large tumors and, and say they have zero pain, completely zero pain. Um, because you have certain types of pain fibers that measure uh, sensation different ways. So like in the gut, typically in the intestinal tract itself, only if you're having tissue damage, like the cells are breaking down and you're getting bleeding, or you have expansion of the gut, uh, either because of backed up feces or gas because uh, the tumor is occluding the lumen, or if the uh, cancer is expansile in the intestinal tract, it will cause pain. But many times people with colorectal pain, cancer don't have pain. It's only when it's expansile. And that's more, that's common in different types of colorectal cancer. So you can also get pain if the tumor itself is pressing on other tissues, other organs, other nerves. Lots of people with cancer in the liver have no pain. Uh, sometimes cancer in the breast and other organs have no pain. Prostate cancer can have no pain related to it. It has just secondary issues that are causing pain. But if the tumor is pressing on a nerve or other tissue, certainly that can be a cause of pain. If it's expansile or destructive bone metastasis, many times, almost always, that will be painful. So if you have some deep bone pain, and we'll talk about the distinguishing characteristics of that in a second, but that can definitely be a cause of pain. Then you can have pain associated with a specific therapy that's being done with the cancer. So if you're going through some sort of therapy, that could be the cause of pain, and that could be good pain or bad pain. If you have direct attack on the cancer, let's say with uh, chemotherapy or with the Rife machine or with a specific nutraceutical approach or with radiation to the cancer, the pain can, can happen with lysis or even apoptosis uh, that's rapid of many cells. You could get pain because of that. More commonly with a therapeutic positive note of cancer. So these would be positive things. This is what I want my pain to cause because from if I'm having pain, can be caused from a local immune response. And that's uh, many times the more common cause of a positive reason a person could have uh, pain at their cancer. Now this is a picture here on the slide showing what an inflammatory immune response would be. Okay, you, you jab yourself with a needle or uh, you know, uh, a sliver of some kind, and it irritates the skin, breaks the skin surface. It sends out all these different chemical cytokines in the second little picture there, it telling the, the immune system to respond to the site because there may be a bacterial infection, there may be uh, you know, something that could invade the body and, and kill this person. So the immune system responds by what the uh, local immune system in the tissue itself and coming from the blood to send in different T cells, macrophages, and immune response to kill whatever infection might be there. And that is, can cause local swelling. Uh, that's going to cause a local inflammatory response. The area could be injured. You could even get this in a sprained ankle. There's a perfect example of this. I twist my ankle, damage tissue. Now, my body doesn't understand where the damage came from. Could it be from some outside 
source like a puncture wound. So you have this huge inflammatory response, all these white blood cells, all these macrophages, T cells, attack the area to kill any uh, possible bacteria that could invade the body and kill the person, and you get all this swelling. So well, we didn't, you know, I sprayed my ankle. I didn't, um, I, don't, I don't need a, an immune response to the area, so we ice it and we elevate it and try to decrease that inflammatory response. But when we're trying to kill cancer, one of the reasons why you're not killing cancer, if the cancer is growing, is that your immune system is not recognizing very well uh, that the cancer is not self-tissue, because the cancer is self-tissue. So then your immune system is not supposed to attack self-tissue. And when we are trying to, uh, to add therapies to get the immune system to attack the cancer, um, we don't want to stop that. So a local immune response to a cancer following therapy, so we're going to give you a lot of immune stimulants, and oh, my cancer has actually gotten a little bit larger since I started care. Um, that's, that doesn't always happen, but that can be a response. Or and it's really because the inflammation around there, the swelling that is involved with this inflammatory response that brings immune cells that can kill the cancer is what's taking place. And we don't want to stop that. So we'll discuss that in a second too. And then you can get pain associated with cancer therapy because the pain is associated with destruction of healthy tissue. And that would be really with chemotherapy side effects, radiation, tissue damage, that's what this picture in the upper left-hand corner is, skin damage from radiation, or post-surgical healing. So I have damaging of healthy tissue because of my cancer therapy, and my pain might not even be near the cancer. So I'm doing chemotherapy for uh, colorectal cancer, and I have pain all over my body. I'm sick, I'm nauseous, I'm throwing up, my chest hurts, you know, my feet hurt, you know, well, because the chemotherapy is attacking healthy tissue and you're getting the side effects thereof. So then we'd want to look at some detoxification work. You can also get referred pain with cancer. So referred pain means the pain that I have at this specific site has nothing to do with cancer at that specific site, but it's referred pain either neurologically or dermatologically or the dermatones, following the dermatones, um, uh, or specific referral points. Here's a chart of some different pain referral areas. So um, you see this picture on the left-hand side of this picture, the liver and gallbladder can refer to the right uh, shoulder, upper trap area, both on the front and the back, the scalene area. Um, the lung and the diaphragm can refer to the opposite side on the left side. And this is never a perfect scenario here. But this gives you some idea of where things can refer pain to and what organ can actually be associated with. There's other uh, charts that follow specific nerve pathways. Let's say if I have cancer at my first lumbar uh, vertebrae that's metastasized to the bone, well, it's going to refer, it can refer pain all the way around the belly and it can refer pain down to the hip socket. That's where L1 nerve root would follow. Um, so uh, pain or uh, metastasis from, let's say, prostate cancer to the sacrum, L5 area, can refer pain all the way down the leg, can refer pain into the foot, into the big toe. So you could get dermatological uh, pathways where that nerve flows referred pain, and it can have nothing to do with that area. So for instance, right shoulder pain can have, can be pain that has nothing to do with anything going on with the right shoulder, there's no metastasis to the shoulder, um, the joint is fine, the muscles are fine, but the pain is, you know, intense, grade seven, eight pain in the, in, the in the right shoulder. You have to start thinking of liver, gallbladder issue. Actually, the gallbladder could refer to the left shoulder as well. Um, and this picture shows on the posterior side of the person's body that it doesn't go down very far, but actually liver gallbladder could go down to really T7, which is considerably lower than this picture shows here. 
Um, so uh, just think about those things when you, a person has pain, um, that it's a referred pain from, a, a diff, from an organ site. And they, this could be a bad thing because if there's a referred pain uh, from a cancer growing, it's, that's not necessarily a, a good thing. It can be a good thing and that it could be a referred pain because of, this, because of the inflammation that's at that, um, uh, the local immune response at the cancer site is causing that referred pain. So that's a possibility. Now, differential diagnosis, that is very difficult without doing some scans and tests, and we'll discuss that. So, and then you can have pain that's unrelated to the cancer. Now, always when we have a cancer diagnosis, we tend to think of anything that we have going on as related to the cancer. Okay, oh my gosh, my foot hurts. Oh, do I have cancer in my foot or is that referred pain? Or did you just twist your ankle or did you sleep on it wrong? Or do you have arthritis? Uh, I mean, how many people over age 50 have some uh, degree of degenerative arthritis in their spine and, their, and you're sleeping differently because of other issues with your cancer and you're holding yourself differently and you're not getting as enough exercise. All these things are related and we want to be careful not to attribute any symptoms that we have to the cancer uh, without at least investigating other possible causes and and you want to investigate those other possible causes of treating that. So some hints on differential diagnosis of this pain associated with tumor growth, typically it, it, it can occur with or without concurrent therapy. So if I'm, uh, my tumor is growing, well, I'm not, I haven't changed the chemotherapy I'm doing or I haven't changed any of my therapy that I've been doing my alternative therapy with the rife and nutrition for three months, and now my pain has increased. Okay, well, that's a little red flag there. So nothing's changed for the last three months, but your pain just increased a week ago and is continuing to increase or is continuing to be at a higher level. We want to do some digging. That's, that's a red flag that something changed, something is going on. Uh, tumor position, pressing on nerves, tissues can fluctuate, can be intermittent various degrees, various different sensations that can happen with that. Many times it'll be sharp if it's a nerve pain, if it's pressing on a nerve, if it's on the tissue on a tissue or an organ, it can be very dull. Um, so that's what is very difficult to differential diagnose. Expansile destructive bone mets, typically that's going to be dull unless there's a fracture of the bone involved, then it can be, you know, very sharp and, and debilitating. But Prior to a fracture, it's typically going to be dull, deep, steady pain, toothache-like, but, but described as a deep pain that they can't really put their finger on it. It's just this deep bone pain. Now, many times referred pain can be deep pain too, um, but it's not going to be at a specific site. Like, it's right there. A referred pain is going to be more of it's here, but it's the size of uh, like the, uh, a, a grapefruit. Right around there. Is it right here? Well, kind of. It feels like right there, but I don't know. That's going to be the difference with referred pain. It's going to be real hard to pinpoint it. With bone metastasis, it's going to be easier to pinpoint it like it's coming from right there and you can put your finger on it. Um, that's part of the differential diagnosis. And again, ultimately, you're going to do a scan or an x-ray or something to, to find that out. Direct attack on a cancer typically is um, aligned with the beginning, a course of a care. So I just started with the rife, and oh my gosh, the pain in my breast has just increased you know, dramatically since I started with the rife. Well, actually, that's a good sign. Now, understand, it's not a bad sign if I just started with the rife, and I didn't feel any different. That's, it's not, that's not a bad sign. Uh, nor is a bad sign. I started with a rife and my cancer is shrunk and I feel a lot better. Well, of course that's a good sign. So it doesn't mean that everybody who starts a new course of care, whether it be chemotherapy or rife or specific nutraceutical therapy, that they will have pain at that cancer. But typically if you have a pain at that cancer site, after starting a specific course of therapy and it 
correlates exactly with, you know, near that start or right after that start of that therapy, it's usually a good sign. It's a sign of lysis, usually, if that's the case, or the in a local immune response. So both of those can be severe at times. They can be extremely painful, um, but usually it's um, uh, a good sign. So pain associated with the destruction of healthy tissue as in chemotherapy, radiation, and post-surgical healing. Um, well, that's pretty easy to differential diagnose because it happened after the care and you're getting it and it's not at the cancer site itself. And the scans may show that the cancer is not receding, but you're getting a lot of pain at other areas. And then referred pain from cancer typically worsens, uh, at, I should say, as, as the cancer uh, progresses. So... Um, that's what you, and that can be dull again. And again, the differential diagnosis on that, it can be hard to like pinpoint. Oh, it's in my shoulder. Well, and somebody's pointed here, here, yeah, there. Is it over here too? Kind of, yeah. It's hard, it's, it's, it's kind of vague. It's a much more vague, though it can be extremely severe pain. Um, and then what are some care options? What do we do about these things? So pain associated with tumor growth, well, you certainly want to adjust the current care. So let's say if I, you know, doing started at uh, our clinic and you're doing well for three months and all of a sudden you have this increased pain and, um, and, it's, and it's slowly getting worse over the course of a week, we need to, that's why I said, it's a red flag, well, you need to call us. So we need to talk about, we need to tweak something. What else do we need to do? Do we need to add something? What do we need to do? Um, that's not necessarily a good sign. Um, what can you do uh, if you have tumor, uh, positional pain, the tumor is pressing on nerves, it's damaging the tissue itself, it's expansile to the tissue itself. Well, think of things like CurcuClear, that's a curcumin, uh, Tereva, which is a whole food uh, um, uh, curcuminoid product that's uh, from turmeric, uh, whole food turmeric, clear inflam, which has a bunch of different anti-inflammatories in there, including ginger, but I put ginger there too. Limitless, and I have a, a podcast on, and a blog post on what this product is. It's got betalins, that is a patented process, how they get the betalins, which is probably one of the most anti-inflammatory things that we have from a, from a nutraceutical standpoint. Think of things like CBD, THC. Uh, THC can be probably the most powerful uh, non-drug uh, tool that we have uh, that can help people with pain. Um, uh, so always consider THC therapies like PEMF, TENS unit can help with uh, tumor positional pain. Expansile bone mats, think of all the above, but add certainly add CG, EGCG, which is the catechin from green tea extract. Our product is uh, Tereva. Uh, that's, uh, that's not Tereva, but it's T, Tivago. That's what it is. Tivago is our product. Um, pain associated with cancer therapy, if it's a direct attack on the cancer, um, and again, it's typically aligned to the beginning of, the, of a course of cancer care. Um, if it's from direct lysis, let's say you just started chemotherapy and your, and your breast pain is really, really bad, go back to the, all those anti-inflammatories that we just talked about. If the pain um, is occurring from a local immune response, would be, which would be, I'm just starting a natural approach. I just started with the Rife and I have a lot of increased pain. Um, yes, you could use curcumin. So I would say, you know, I put in here non-anti-inflammatories, even though curcumin, uh, uh, turmeric is a, considered an anti-inflammatory, it's also so high in the cancer killer list. Uh, there's so many studies on how well it can do as far as just killing cancer. I, I would not exclude those with the local immune response issues, but we're not trying to, the reason why I said non-anti-inflammatories is that the goal is it to decrease the inflammation and we want that inflammatory response. Now understand there's a difference between a chronic inflammatory response from chronic disease, chronic ill health, poor diet, 
which can cause cancer, versus an acute inflammatory response, which is an immune response, an immune attack to that site. So we're talking about the site of a cancer. We want an immune attack to the site of the cancer. That's how Coley's toxin, toxins therapy worked. Um, I have data on that on my, on my website. In, the, in years past, that's, we can't do it anymore. It's against the law. And it worked because you're basically producing a local inflammatory response um, that can help the body kill that cancer. That's, that's how um, infrared heat, uh, deep infrared heat, it works. Same thing. Uh, that's what we're doing when we're adding uh, immune stimulants, which is everybody who's on a cancer killer for nutraceutical from our office, that's an immune stimulant. We're trying to create that local immune response. So we don't want to take a whole bunch of anti-inflammatories to negate that per se. So we think of therapies like PEMF and TENS unit, they can help because they work a different way. They block the pain uh, pathway with not really decreasing the inflammation. CBD and THC, again, is always a thing that you could use for pain because even though this might be a good pain, quote unquote, um, it's not real fun. So you still want to, yes, you tolerate, but is there ways to decrease the pain uh, without decreasing the, the local inflammation? Yes, there are. Pain associated with the destruction of healthy tissues. Obviously, you're thinking of detoxification therapies because we just got to get those poisons out of the body so that that will decrease. And referred pain from cancer, well, then you go back to the anti-inflammatories to try to decrease that uh, just that, re that pain. Um, and of course, pain unrelated to the cancer, make sure that you find the cause. Okay, hopefully that was helpful. I am going to unmute us and open it up to questions and questions about this or unrelated topics are free for the next 15 minutes. So, if you have a question, just let me know. Dr. Connors, is there a RIFE program that you would recommend um, like for arthritis or fibromyalgia? Uh, so for arthritis, um, so remember there's two different kinds of arthritis. So there's degenerative arthritis and inflammatory arthritis. So degenerative arthritis is the one I mentioned here earlier is that everybody gets. We have, you know, wear and tear on your joints and you have arthritis due to just degeneration of those joints. It can be worse if you had an old injury and that joint can, you know, decay away. And that can be extremely painful. Um, is there a RIFE program for that? The RIFE isn't going to really heal that. I would always think with any um, musculoskeletal issues to, to use, um, you could use some swelling programs. I think there's some inflammatory programs. There's accelerated healing and the normalizing frequency uh, program. But really, um, degenerative arthritis, the RIFE isn't going to like do massive benefits to that. So you want to look at other things too. Um, if it's in a large joint, capsule filled joint like your knee or ankle or your shoulder, think chondroitin, glucosamine. Um, any of these anti-inflammatories that we discuss here would be beneficial for that. Um, if it's a, a different type of arthritis, which is called inflammatory arthritis, that's caused from some inflammatory agent. Those are um, uh, like rheumatoid uh, arthritis, which these are all autoimmune diseases, all the inflammatory arthritises. And there's a causal factor to those. Many times, the, um, many times it's a toxin. Usually it's a toxin. We used to see a lot of non-cancer patients. We saw a lot of um, inflammatory autoimmune arthritides and very common, it was a heavy metal toxicity. So doing detoxification work can be helpful with that. 
um, and different anti-inflammatories could be helpful with that too. So that's where the rife can be more beneficial with the inflammatory arthritis because you can do the foot detox and um, some of the other detox programs that could be beneficial. Um, make sure again, when you're looking at detox, that you're going through those, um, those uh, pathways of detoxification. You don't want to be trying to detox heavy metals out of your tissue if you're only having a bowel movement every two days because you will just make yourself more toxic. Or if you have cancer in your liver, you don't want to be trying to do that also, which, are, which is going to just could be overloading to your liver. So you want to use caution with that when you're dealing with other issues like cancer. But if you do have any of those issues, um, make sure you um, bring them up on the Facebook page too so I can see who's asking and we can get more specific answers for you as, as an individual too. Dr. Connors, this is Marie. Yes. Um, I have a question. I'm wondering uh, about detoxing uh, your body if uh, for possibly parasites, like liver flukes or anything like that. Is there any kind of a particular detox uh, that you would recommend? Yeah, so, uh, so parasites, so if we classify parasites as anything that's living off of you um, in an unhealthy way, um, including your teenage children, then there's different ways to deal with that. Of course, not, you're not going to detox your teenage children, but sometimes it's a, it's a must. But anyhow, that's another subject. So parasitic infections like liver flukes, um, typically liver flukes, uh, the old saying was uh, cloves. Oops. I'm going to mute everybody for a second. Oh, hello. Uh, typically, liver flukes, it's been said that liver, cloves are the last meal of a liver fluke. We use a product called peritocin for liver flukes. Now, again, um, I'm not suggesting that you jump into any parasite cleanse protocol. Um, if you're dealing with stage four cancer and it's, you know, very active. But, um, so talk to us individually, please, about this. But we use proverbifuge as a general parasite cleanse and peritocin as a, that typically tests, it can test for other parasites too, but it, that typically tests for liver flukes. Usually if a person's testing for parasites and you can lock it in over the liver, peritocin's gonna, that's, that's gonna test out. But also we have Paraclear, which is, uh, has wormwood and some other things in it, but not as many things as the Proverbifuge. So there's multiple different parasite cleanses that you could use depending on if it's a tapeworm or roundworm in the intestinal tract, or if it's a liver fluke, or it's something systemic, or it's in your brain, or it's, you know, because parasites, different types of parasites can attack you in all different areas of your body. But um, those are, that's a good question. Parasites are a lot more common than people think. There was an article out in the uh, AMA journal, oh, it was about 10 years ago, I think, that said, if you live in the southern half of the United States, you have, I, I don't know, it was like an astronomical number, like 85% chance that you, already, that you have a parasite. You don't know it if you live in the northern half of the United States, there's a 35% chance that you have a parasite. You don't know it. Um, just because down south where it's warmer, they don't die, you could get them. Most common uh, source of parasite um, in your body is gonna be your pets, animals that you uh, are exposed to. Um, outside, you're exposed to parasites, hookworms, all sorts of different things. Food that you eat um, that is improperly cooked. Um, we've had patients with uh, uh, trichinosis, as a cause for cancer, trichinosis is a cause for severe migraines. Uh, and you think trichinosis, are you kidding? That's from undercooked pork. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's crazy. Parasites are real and they're real common.
Any other questions? Someone asked a question about the coronavirus, and is that a serious thing to consider? And what should we do about it? Are there some things that we could do about it? Yes, uh, is it serious? Should we consider it a serious threat? Um, I don't know yet. There's a lot of um, information that is coming out of different sources that it's hard to know the bias of that information. Um, I tend to be extremely skeptical of different diseases that uh, the mainstream uh, media tells us that we're all going to die from and scares people into getting doing things that maybe they wouldn't do if they were thinking clearly and not functioning completely out of fear, like getting very um, inadequate uh, uh, vaccinations that have adjuvants that can cause all sorts of problems, including cancer. Um, and I wonder who is gaining out of some of these fearful tactics that, I mean, uh, ever since I can remember, almost every year we're going to die of something, whether it's Zika or whatever it is. Uh, now the coronavirus, and they're going to have come out with a vaccine against it and make billions uh, by using those fear tactics. Now, is it possible that it is really a scary virus, and there's there's there is um, adequate uh, data to warrant uh, fear or, or action that should be taken? I don't know. That's possible. What can you do from a natural perspective? Well, certainly most of the things that all our cancer patients are doing, like I said, you are on immune stimulants. So taking immune stimulants are beneficial. Um, also, there are certain specific viral uh, killers from a natural perspective. We have a product called ViraClear, which um, we use for a lot of people with viruses. Um, Berberine is a great antiviral, antibacterial. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that we use for viral things. As far as the RIFE goes, you have a viral complex program that you could certainly run. Plus, if you update your RIFE, and remember how to update your RIFE, if you've been, um, if you started with us in the last month or so, your the, the the new coronavirus program should be on your RIFE. If it's not on your RIFE, then you can uh, log into the internet and then at any page on the RIFE, you hit update. And as long as you're connected to the internet, it takes about five minutes to download anything new that was created by True RIFE or us and it will be in your program and it will not interrupt or disrupt the program that we created for you. So, um, uh, again, True Rife came out with a coronavirus program. You can run the viral program, take antiviral things. You just be wise in what you're doing. And by all means, you do not do a vaccine or something like this and uh, cause more problems. So, all right, any other questions? Uh, this is Claudia. Um, can I ask a question? I, I don't ask a question until everyone has their cancer questions answered. So I'm just waiting. No, you just go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, we do want to come out to see you, but I wanted to check about the timing, whether it should be sooner or whether it should be later. Um, I think everything's okay with the cancer, um, but my concern is my memory, and um, I kind of figure that I, maybe we had moved about six months ago, and the neighborhood we moved into has 5G, and it doesn't have the telephone poles with it on it. You know, I was really happy. I didn't realize it was, there was 5G here. Um, you know, they didn't have the telephone poles, but they have those boxes. We have underground wiring, and there's a um, box that kind of looks like a small refrigerator in our front yard. I don't know if that has anything to do with what I'm experiencing. Um, when we first moved in, 
I was experiencing dizziness during the night. And so I turned off our um, router um, during the night, which that helped. Um, but I'm still experiencing, well, memory problems ringing in my ears. Um, uh, I have some um, early Parkinson's symptoms, which you had already, um, like, you know, known about, I guess, because of my genes. Um, and so I'm, so I guess pretty much memory problems, sleep problems, and really loud ringing in my ears, all kinds of noises. Oh. Um, as long as I keep the 5G off during the night, I haven't been dizzy. Um, whenever my mother-in-law was dying and I slept um, with, uh, at the nursing home in her room for a week, when I slept there, I slept well. Now, I slept on like a really comfortable mattress, so I don't know if it was that or if it was the, um, you know, if it was just the mattress or if it had to do with our environment that I'm having problems sleeping. So I guess my question is, if I have all kinds of Alzheimer's, um, you know, documentaries, and um, I could look into all of that and try different things, or should I just, um, come in and be checked out for everything. Should I work on some things here or should I come in sooner and have you um, check out things before me trying to figure it out? Okay. So number one, um, uh, remember I posted for you to send us your updated email? Okay. Because when I, I, I did create an Alzheimer's dementia, early dementia Parkinson's protocol, and uh -huh. oh, um, okay. And I tried to email it to you, and it kept bouncing back. So, uh, I'm um, sorry. I don't know I, if you okay. changed your email no, um, cool. <laughs> last six I'm, months or something. Okay. So if you could just no. email the clinic, write that down so you remember to do that, and then yeah. I will send yeah. that to you because um, I've had that done okay. now for over a week. So I want to get that over. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I did. I don't know if Michelle said something. I thought I sent something to you, but I probably didn't. Yeah, so I, didn't I will go ahead and do in. that. No, no, I probably didn't because you would know more than me. Um, oh, you know, just, so. If you could do that again, that would be great. But that in itself sure. is just a general protocol. I mean, I could literally post it up on the Facebook page because it would be good general protocol for early dementia, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, uh, or Parkinson's. Anybody could do that. Yeah. It's not a specific okay. protocol. If you're going to come here, it'd be better to test you on these things. You don't aren't buying things that aren't yeah. necessarily going to be beneficial yeah. for you. Plus, we do want to mm -hmm. get to the cause in which you started to open up that door a little bit. Could it be the 5G? Could it be the electric? Mm -hmm. So that, that thing that looks like a refrigerator out in your front yard, that is not your, um, that's not the 5G. Um, okay, good. That okay. is the uh, that's the underground electrical. So that's mm -hmm. that's electricity right. coming into your house. Now, can you have dirty electricity at your house that's causing issues? Why? Sure, you can. Dirty electricity can be a source of EMF damage um, and exposure to your house. So um, mm -hmm. definitely, I'd say that's a possibility. Um, but the 5G in the area, that is, that's um, coming through your walls from some tower. That's, whole, that's uh, your cell phone tower that's somewhere within a mile of your house. Oh, um, okay. Okay. Um, and then to combat that, um, it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah, turning off your router at night, that helps. Turning off uh, your cell phone at night, putting your cell phone mm -hmm. in a Faraday cage of some sort, like the we got the new okay. EMF um, things in the bags in that we created that are kind mm -hmm. of put your router in uh, that you can throw your phone in, keep your phone away from your um, in, out of your bedroom at night, even if it's turned off. Um, but still okay. you have 5G that's tra traversing through your body. Just if you don't have any receiver near that, it's going to be less. So that's, those mm -hmm. are beneficial things. Um, and, then, okay. uh, and then we do want to check. There's other possible 
oh, this, my symptom is worse since I moved. It can be due to EMF sources nearer that place. It can be used due to dirty electricity, like we talked about. It can be due to some undiscovered uh, mold or something like that too. So um, that's where having you here and testing you would be beneficial so that oh, testing you would be sooner rather than later then I guess. Okay, good. And we do, I just looked on that side of our house, and we do have a smart read meter um, pretty much beside our bedroom on the outside oh. wall. So yeah. that may, um, you know, that, that may have something so to do with those, all this. So if you get one of those bags that we have, you can, you can put mm -hmm. that outside as well and just fasten it to that smart meter around the smart meter, and that will help too. Or you could call the electrical company and demand that they come and remove that. Oh, good. Okay. I would rather have it be gone. Okay. So then the, the plan should be to come out soon um, as opposed to trying to fix it myself then. Yeah, because we might be just throwing darts at the board if we don't, if we don't know. But So if you're going to come yeah. out maybe sooner than later. Yes, yes, and I will send you my email then. <laughs> okay. okay, well, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I, I, um, um, I help my daughter with her music, and I'm watching three little ones, so, <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> so, okay, well, God bless you. Thank you. We will, um, I'll talk to George, and then we'll get him out there. Okay, sounds good. Another okay. question came in, said, uh, I've been having headaches uh, since coming in this week. Nothing bad. Is there something I should do uh, for that? Well, headaches, okay. Is it because, so the thing I didn't talk about pain and now that just reminded me, I guess I should need to redo my slide presentation, is pain from uh, possible detoxification uh, Herxheimer reaction. And that's not uncommon either. That would fall into pain associated with cancer ther the therapy itself. So you're doing some sort of therapy that's causing detoxification. Um, and typically a common symptom of that is a headache. <laughs> so you get a toxic headache after you know, starting with the Rife machine. That's a sign of lysis usually. So because it's endotoxins that are causing the um, inflammation in the vascular uh, in the in the brain. So yes, you could, definitely you could do some infusion of essential oils if that makes you feel better. But really, it's increasing your water intake, um, doing a foot bath program. Uh, if you have a sauna, doing a sauna, doing a hot pad over your liver, um, doing a castor oil pack over your liver. If possible, to do a um, coffee enema. So detoxification things is what you'd think of. Uh, doing an Epsom salt bath, uh, doing an Epsom salt foot bath. Those are the things that I would suggest first. Certainly there's nothing wrong with taking something to cut that pain if it's a really bad headache, of course. Um, the headache is there. Remember, all pain is a sign. Just keep that in mind. Pain is a sign of something going on. It's really an alert system for your body and it's an alarm telling you that there's something something happening. Um, it's not always a bad thing. That's what we discussed today. But it's not always pleasant. It doesn't mean you want to keep it, the pain, I mean, um, even if a good thing is taking place that's causing it. So look, you know, go back and watch this again. Look at these different possible things that you could do. Add that pain associated with cancer therapy that I just discussed there, detoxification, uh, pain, Herxheimer pain, um, and think about detoxification pathways for that. All right, uh, if no other questions, we will sign off for tonight. Uh, make sure you ask questions on the Facebook page as well. And again, for people who are new, if you have a question that is more private, you can certainly ask it in the chat. You don't want your name up. Um, and certainly when you do ask a question, there is no reason for you to say who you are unless you so desire to do so. There's no reason to announce. I don't think anybody can see your name pop up when you talk. So, um, and it, ask that question in the chat if you have a personal question or email the question to the clinic email or the info at Connors Clinic. Uh, but please put a Zoom call question 
in the message part. So, because we just get so many emails that it will get lost and we won't address it. All right. Well, thank you very much. We will see you all next week. Hopefully, you'll have a very blessed week and be pain free. All right. Bye bye. Bye.